material and why. And then let's look about looking into uh, how the materials evolved up to now and uh, what kind of a composite materials we have and uh, what you and you know what you have seen you probably uh, have seen it many times uh, but you would probably did not know that you were looking at it or using it and uh, then uh, we'll watch some videos about the uh, how the aerospace uh, aviation industry and the automotive industry how they're using the composite materials a little bit about the future material and uh, and also why material is important um so this is me so um i'm a sri lankan oops see this is hold on a second So I'm a Sri Lankan and um, like, you know, I'm married and I have a wife and a two kids and um, it doesn't matter how, uh, how far I go or what job I do. I always think myself as a student like you guys. I never feel that I am, I have achieved everything that I need to achieve or have learned everything I wanted to learn. Always uh, open my mind to uh, re learn new things. So, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a student every day, and I'm an engineer and a researcher in profession. I, uh, I, I do not like to be an engineer all the time, or no, I do not want to be a researcher all the time. I like to do some research, and then apply those research, and uh, and then um, uh, and to see the the the, the product come to uh, to. To, to a life. And also I'm a traveler. I like to travel and, um, and I like to fly and I'm a pilot as well. Um, but I'm not a commercial pilot. I am just a recreational pilot and uh, I haven't not done flying in a while. This picture was taken about two years or three years ago. That was the last time I flew uh, using one of my friends uh, uh, airplane. Um, it's because it's, it, you know, I got quite busy with the kids and everything. So I haven't not flown any time um, recently. I did my, um, my degree in uh, AAC. I'm actually one of the founding uh, uh, students at AAC, the degree program. Um, and I also uh, studied my first uh, flying lessons at AAC as well a long time ago. Uh, I do not know whether you guys know about a gentleman called uh, Dr. Ravi Jevardhana, he's my, uh, he's my uh, uh, inspiration. He, um, had a, a, you know, he used to have his own three airplanes parked inside the, uh, the, the Ratmalani airport. And I used to go around and look around when I was about your age. And uh, I started learning a few things from him and, uh, and decided that I'm gonna join the AAC to do the, the studies. And after that, I did my, uh, so after I did my aerospace engineering, and then um, I, uh, I decided that I wanted to pursue my uh, ed further education and, and, the, and, and the field in composites material. Um, that's how I got into this, what I do right now. So I've been in a, uh, quite a few uh, companies across the globe in, uh, my speciality is a uh, starting up a new airplane programs. Uh, basically understanding the materials that an airplane needs to, uh, uh, needs to consume and then uh, design uh, a production system like a factory, how to use that material and turn that material into an airplane shape, how to do that and how to uh, design the machines that build that kind of stuff that's my speciality and um, and i love do what i do what you see in this picture is a uh, my team um and uh, they are like uh, my best friends um they are a great team of people uh from a di different backgrounds and each one of them brings a different value uh, nobody is higher or lower than me everybody's equal um and we work as a single team that's me. So uh, before I move forward, oh, by the way, uh, I went to uh, 
uh, Thurston uh, in Colombo and to Royal Institute in uh, in Colombo as well um, for my um, did my O levels and A levels and I used to play rugby uh, quite a bit for Thurston College um, and for a little bit in the clubs as well and I have roots that uh, embedded in Colombo and Candy as well so that's me any questions about me All right. Okay, before I go and ask you guys, oh, before I go and rambling through these uh, pictures and what it means, anybody know what's, what's composites means and composites material means? Anybody know? So, the, uh, sorry, go ahead. Somebody was talking. Uh, is it the combination of many materials together? Absolutely. It's a combination of many materials together. That's the word composites coming from. And there are different kinds of composites. And uh, what your bones, your hands, your uh, how your body is structured is also a composition of different materials. Now, Using those materials in a smart way is the, uh, the, the, the area of the field that we are in. How to convert those materials into a smarter way. The nature or our human body already knew how to convert those materials into a smarter way to achieve certain things. Just by having a bone would not be strong enough to, for your body. Or just by having a muscle is not enough for your body you need to have a composition of the muscle and the bone to have a stronger arm or a stronger leg. So that's the composites. So what it does, and um, if you guys have seen uh, uh, a, a building constructions, you have seen the metal rods laying down first and then people are pouring uh, uh, concrete. That's a type of a, a, a composite. It's a... Uh, we call it a, a metal re steel reinforced composites. So the steel in the uh, in a in a construction site gives the we call it a load path load bearing material. That means if there is a wind or if there is an earthquake, the the metal rods are the ones that take the load, and then it will transfer the load to the concrete, and that's how it works. Similarly. If you uh, get into a fight at school or with your friend, when you punch somebody or with you punch a wall or something, first your bone, before your bone, the, 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 uh, the muscle is the one that take the, absorb the shock and then that shock getting transferred to your bone. And then if you have a two bones like on your, on your leg, It'll, the, the muscle is the one that transferring the, uh, the loads or the force to, uh, for the both of the, the, uh, the bones. When the force exceeds the capability of the bone, that's when the bone breaks. Similarly, if you exceed the wind or if you exceed the earthquake magnitude, then the metal will bend and the, and the structure will fall. And, and also, without knowing to us, we also use composites in our day-to-day -day life. If you look at your uh, ropes that you can buy, the traditional, uh, the coconut husk rope, those are also composite. They are very strong when you're pulling it. They are not strong when you're pushing against it. It's like a noodle, right? It'll try to bend. But when you're pulling it, it's really, really strong, right? So what is, what's missing in there is the muscle part or the concrete part. So, but if you can take that rope and dip it in in a bucket of glue or a bucket of paint, and then it can get stronger, right? To some level, right? You have seen it, right? Like, uh, remember when you guys were eating some sugary stuff, sugary uh, drinks or ice cream and stuff like that? When you drip onto your shirt, what's gonna happen after a while? Can anybody tell me when you drip, ice cream or something and you did not wash right away if you leave it for about a few hours or didn't tell your parents that you drip some sweets in your on your clothes what's going to happen to that particular part of the clothes it's 
getting harder, right? Have you not seen that? You guys are not eating any ice cream or any sugary stuff. It's getting harder, right? But yeah. it, that's because the, the, the sugar acting as the concrete or acting as the muscle mm. and your shirt is the, the fiber or the uh, reinforcement or the bone or the metal rod or the rope. So similarly, for the, over the years, we, the scientists and the engineers, looked into how can we use the same way to build a man-made material and turn that into the structures. So that's what we're gonna learn today. We're gonna learn not the natural ones, we're natural ones and we'll discuss a little bit about the natural ones, but we're gonna look into how does the, how, was, how does the, this composite evolve and how does it became a, uh, uh, you know, uh, something that can, uh, uh, in your vehicles, in your airplanes or everywhere else in the world, how does it happen? So we're gonna talk about that today. So do you guys have any questions about this small introduction we have about the materials? If you guys don't ask me the questions, I'm gonna ask the questions. And if you guys don't answer to my questions, then I'm gonna to come to your place on the next time around and gonna ask you guys a question. So, so you guys need to talk. <laughs> yeah. Guys, you don't can talk. Don't worry. This yeah. is a very friendly conversation. Yeah, anyone yeah. can talk, anyone. You can ask any questions, basically anything. Anything, right? All good? All right. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide and I'm hoping that you guys have questions. If you guys don't have questions, I'm, I'm assuming you guys understood what I'm saying, then I'm going to ask you guys some questions to make sure that you guys learn something. So, uh, all right, let's go to the next one. So, do you, if you thought the composites material that we are using today, um, it was just built a few years ago. That was incorrect. Our forefathers, especially in the countries like Sri Lanka or the oldest civilizations in the world, we use composites way before even the we you know what we have invented today for the airplanes. Uh, you have seen the uh, the old Sri Lankan village homes that's made out of clay. And so that's a composite, that's a composite structure. That is a very strong structure that made out of clay. And sometimes they use the cow manure uh, or sometimes it's a mixture of cow, cow manure, uh, clay and uh, straws, you know, the, uh, the leftover from, from the paddy fields. Now tell yeah. me why, what is the, uh, why the cow manure can be used to build structures? What is the special thing about cow manure? You know what cow manure is, right? Goma, goma. No. Goma. Have you not? Have you guys seen goma? Yes, yes. Yeah, we have seen. Get yes. right. okay. after some time. Say that. Say that again. Why the why the, why goma is very useful to build structures? It get fixed for after some time. Yeah, go for it. I, I didn't catch exactly the full sentence. Can you can you repeat that answer again? Uh, it get fixed after some time when you apply yes. it. Yeah, and how why is it getting fixed up? Do you know? Have you have you have you had a, like a chance to see a little bit of a close up those those uh, cow manure when it get all hardened up? Yeah. 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 There are well, some wood, uh, like woolen uh, type of structure inside it. Yeah. yeah, it's because he's eating grass, right? Ah, grass, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he's eating a lot of leaves and grass. So the leaves and grass, when he chew, it doesn't get digested, right? Only the leaf part is getting digested. And it gets all mixed up inside his stomach. And when he poop, what he will end up is like the strains, right? The, yeah. the leaf strains. And with the, with the rest of the liquid, when it get hardened up, it's becoming a composite, like, uh, like what we saw earlier, right? Yeah. So that's what our forefathers knew about those. So that's why they used uh, those materials to build uh, their, their houses or even to, uh, 
you make their weapons like the bow and arrows uh, and, uh, and even if you guys been to candy if you guys been to anuradhapura Polonara, all of those time frames you have seen the mixture of those different uh, materials those structures now those are natural composites you know why we call it natural composites it's from the environment from the, from the uh, environment they are not how, how sir how can uh, bow and arrow be a composite ah good question so on a certain parts of the world like for an example uh, a turkish turkish bow what they do is they uh, they take the uh, certain wood that can bend specifically a wood called balsa it's very bendable and then they wrap that with a uh, rubber so it gives an extra tension extra spinning moment so when you when you have a rod that actually can bend but when you wrap uh -huh. that with the rubber it will spring back up right so when you pull it will bend really hard and then as soon as you release the uh, the arrow this thing will you know come back to the straight or to the original shape that gives more power so because it's combined to two or three different natural materials it's also a composite so oh, okay. yeah thank so you some people they wrap the uh, the bow they wrap with the uh, uh, what do you call a uh, uh, threads like a, 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 a coconut husk or some sort of a natural husk uh, thread so it will give a more reinforcement to it so that's how the the bows were made in the old days. Not every bow, but a specific bows in that built in Turkey and uh, and around that region. From there, people start evolving the material. Now, now all this time we were talked about the natural composites, and then from that point onwards, around the 1800s onwards, now we people start uh, using rubber you all of you guys have seen the rubber plantations right yeah yeah and there are rubber coming out now the rubber start mixing up with other material and then from there the scientists discovered or invented the new types of material those are called the man made material like we call it the inorganic or the polymers and things. so those are like still a chemical it's a combination of a different uh, chemical compositions we put together and we come up with the new material form now those are the ones that we start using those are much much stronger and much lighter than the uh, the, the natural fibers or the natural composites so that's how we start transition from a natural composite to a more advanced man-made composite. Now, what would you think the biggest advantage and the disadvantage uh, between the, uh, the natural composite versus the man-made composites? What would be the, the primary difference? Strength. Uh, yeah, the strength is a uh, one factor, but let's. I would not say the strength is the the one of the differences, but uh, there will be a couple of more other more obvious ones. What would be the most obvious one? Like in natural, uh, we can't uh, control the uh, structure size or the uh, how. Like now we'll say like this goma. Now yeah. it is for a. Uh, small small parts so uh, yeah. combining is uh, I, I think combining is can't do uh, as we want yes uh, that's, that's the, true the i want a little bit more different i want a little bit more uh, simple answer do you i know you guys know about this you guys are not you guys are thinking too deep <laughs> can't control the entity if it's natural uh that's combination sort of, but it's too too deep i want a very fundamental thing you guys know this thing <laughs> all right i'm gonna give you guys a uh to give you gonna give you the answer so how often do you so when you have a goma or when you have the clay uh the, the yeah. what do you call clay mixed uh, structures like uh, the old houses what's happened over time it became melted it is it's, uh, it's, uh, it's disintegrating yeah. it's falling apart right because the the bacteria the the environment can eat up and biodegradable 
right? It's good for the environment, but you have to keep making it, right? And so the man-made composite does not gonna degrade that fast. It have a long life. And the second part is, if you take a, uh, let's say a pot of goma into your hand, I, I'm pretty sure you haven't, but uh, let's say a pot of clay. Let's take, oh, let's, let's do this. You have, you, I'm pretty sure at some point in your life, you have lifted a clay pot, right? From a cooking clay pot, right? Yeah. And I'm pretty sure you also have lifted a similar kind of a clay pot or the size of a pot, but not made out of clay, but made out of plastic, right? Yeah. Which one is lighter? Plastic. The plastic one. Plastic, right? Yeah. So if I have a material that is lighter and stronger and lasts long, that is yeah. better to use on a structures than actually uh, uh, the natural ones, right? Mm, now, yeah. It, yeah, the biggest disadvantage is the, the man-made ones or the inorganic ones are hard to uh, degrade. So it would not, it's going to, you know, stay for millions of years. It's bad for the, for the, uh, for the environment. But then again, you would not build a plastic house no, you would not build a, a clay airplane for you to fly, right? <laughs> so it works both well. However, the oldest airplanes that you have seen, and I have a strong believer on this too. Um, you guys heard about the uh, the King Ravana and his uh, yeah. uh, Bonera, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. It would not be made out of uh, the new age composites materials. It would have <laughs> made, made out of a natural composite. And I can, I can assure you, it would be fine. It, it is a flyable. If you can use natural composites to fly, like a balsa wood or a certain wood type that we use, uh, we are still using to build a small uh, airplanes for lesser flying, they are made out of composites material. Now, obviously, we apply different uh, chemicals for it to stay longer, like what you do in your furniture in your house. But those are strong as the as the uh, the advanced uh, composites we use today. But now, when you are looking at going really fast, making a very exotic shapes like the BMW vehicle that I have over here, and have to take lots of loads because of the wind, the weather, and etc. Um, because of those things, now you wanted to you cannot use the the natural fibers it has its yeah. limitations so now we start manufacturing and designing and altering the the chemistry of the composites so it will be lighter faster and stronger so we can use to a uh, advancement in our technology uh -huh. yeah. so let's go let's go and take a look at any questions on the evolution of the composites like where we were about the 10,000 BC before Christ to what we are here at 2020, how everything got. If you look at this graph, you can see at the very yeah. beginning, uh, it's all about the, uh, the composites that we used on a natural. And then suddenly there was a period that we will stop using most of the natural fibers because that's the time we were very heavily start using aluminum, steel, uh, kind of a metals and then we start coming back up again now we are going into a much more we don't want to be heavy so the metal is good but it's too heavy and so we are going into the composites uh, yeah. so it's lighter and stronger it's sure, more stronger is, than yeah sure what is the main use material that may consist of air that the 90 percent is air and uh, Oh, you're talking about the, so there are different types of composites. Like uh, if you, the word composites is a still a very broad one. Um, yeah. So you have a nano composites, right? Yeah. Nano, nano tubes are the future of the composites. That means it's the same composite material. But um, imagine if you take your hair, right? Yeah. If you take your hair and, uh, and imagine that I can build a tube inside the hair with the reinforcement, right? Now, if I take a, a, a composite material today, they were more like this. This is a, a fabric. 
So each one of these, uh, let me see. Let me see if I can open this thing up quickly. So you can see this is a sort of a fabric, right? And you can see there, there we go. And you can, if you take a look at this, right? Look at this. I don't know whether you can see it. I'm gonna get closer. They are actually smaller than my hair. Yeah. You cannot even see it, right? Um, so yeah. all of those put together, and that's what I've made a little rope out of it, ropes, and then the little ropes, like stitch like where you're stitching your uh, clothes, and then became a fabric. Now look, this, this is the composite, right? Now this this is stitched in a special way. If I pull from the corners, it'll stretch. Look at that. Yeah. It stretch really, really long, right? But it's super hard. But then if I stretch the other way, it doesn't stretch. It's super, super, super strong again. And yeah. the reason for that is. I can stitch this material different ways. And when I put the layers together, I can make sure which side, whatever the side that needs more loads will have be more stiffer. This area, the, the side that does not need the loads, I can make it more softer. So there are techniques for that. So when, I, when you put this thing, there is a lot of air trapped in here. There is a lots of air trapped in here. Yeah. But I, will, I, I do not, I'm not, not going to keep the air when I, I'll show you a little later on when I'm making this into a part. I'm trying to get this air out and all this, you know, all these layers, I want it to be in one stack, like a laminate, we call it, right? Okay, good questions. Any more questions? And I'm going to go to the next slide. Wait, you can now look at the material. Ah, material where is it? I just had it here. We go. This make it api kiyanne carbon. This is a carbon fabric. Making me wa give and tamai then like on new like if you go to the new car bodies like the even if you have seen the spoilers and everything you can this is the outer layer of the spoiler. Oh. But the spoiler that you see in those cars they don't perform the same way because they are more cosmetic, right? They, they don't have to go like in an airplane, like a bending kind of thing. Mm. To do that, there will be a different kind. It's the same material, but we're going to use it in a different way. I will show you that in a second. So this is a carbon composites. Yeah. Now, I want each one of you guys to tell me, now, I've already given you guys some examples, but you cannot use those as examples. I want you guys to name two of the natural fibers that you think you can find around your house. And I think I can see one of your guys in the house already have that. I can even see it. <laughs> it's probably somebody's behind. I can see somebody's behind. There is a, a, a sort of a natural fiber. I think I might, I'll probably will verify later. Come on, give me a coconut two. husk. What is it? Coconut husk. Yeah, very good. Coconut husk is one. It's a very good fiber. What's another for natural fiber? Um, Something you like, you probably eat in the morning with kiribat. And mm -hmm. there is an old saying uh, in the Lindala Kotorwa, Ega Hata Banana? Banana, yeah, the banana, banana has, yeah, the banana tree, not the banana. Oh, yeah, the, banana tree, right? the tree has. Yeah. yeah, so if I take that fiber, and let's say that you wanted to make a laminate, a structure out of it, uh, like it's flying on an airplane, how would you, what would you mix with that fiber to make it stronger and harder? Something natural again. Um... Easy thing to do is rubber. You know, if you guys go, go to the you know to the rubber plantation, if you take the rubber, like you know they they layering it. Have you guys seen how they make the rubber like rubber sheets and everything? Yeah. Imagine yeah. like before, they, before you make the rubber sheet, you go and lay those strands on that uh, 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 what do you call that tray and let it set in. 
now you have a resin that reinforced with that natural fiber. Or you can take any kind of a glue or a gum or whatever, right? You apply to it and, and put it in there. I think I, I, I don't see the name, but it says user. Uh, right yes. behind his, that's you. Right yes. behind, your, behind you, there is a, a, a parallel, right? That's on your, on your window at the back. At the back. Yeah, yeah that's a parallel, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a natural fiber. Those are those are made out of uh, bamboo. bamboo. Yeah. Bamboos. Yeah. So if yeah. you bamboo is a natural fiber, you can take the bamboos to make uh, fabric. If you if you pound. Oh, you can see that far. I didn't know. That. <laughs> <laughs> those are all natural fibers, uh, um, and they are very strong as well. Yeah. And. Um, how about fiberglass? So, I mean, you're pretty sure you guys been to the doctors and you'll be sitting on those chairs, right? The... <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, <clears throat> those are fiberglass uh, <clears throat> uh, composites. <clears throat> <clears throat> Pardon me for a second. And the, uh, the fishing boats. <clears throat> Fishing boats also made out of fiberglass, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, most of the uh, the water park you guys have it in Nigambo, I think, and I think that I took this this mm. picture is from the Nigambo water park. Yeah. yeah. So most of those slides and everything made out of uh, fiberglass composites, and uh, do you know why they were made out of fiberglass composites? One of the reasons, one of the big reasons why. Yeah, that durable. What's that? Durable. Durable. Uh, durable, yeah. Um, but there is a much more um, waterproof. Bigger uh, no, no, no. <laughs> once again, uh, so it's cheap. It's very cheap. If you if you get a carbon composite, it's very expensive. Your spoiler in your car is very expensive than actually one of those seats. So imagine if you all made out of a carbon composites, right? The doctor has to charge you for eight times the the, the fee, right? So that's why those are cheap. And those boats are cheap. And uh, because if you made out of carbon composite, there are yachts, uh, catamarans, it's a high end boats made out of carbon composites, like the, what I yeah. showed you earlier. But they are very, very expensive. A ship, a fisherman cannot afford those. So you have to uh, make out of uh, uh, fiberglass. And uh, carbon composites, we, we're going to talk this a little bit more later. We're going to use it heavily on new airplanes, A350 and 787. And what you see is a, uh, a new space vehicle that I worked on uh, before I took a new assignment about a year ago. That's called XSP that can go out of space and come back again and land like an airplane. Um, and then uh, the bicycles. The, the new bicycles, most of the champions, when they ride, they ride on a, a carbon frame uh, bicycles. Obviously not anybody, everybody can afford those because they are very expensive. Uh, so you have a fiberglass versions as well as the aluminum versions of the bicycle too. Uh, but, but there are other areas, and I don't know whether you have, came, have ever come across, but there are other items that you may or may have may have seen or may have used made out of uh, carbon composites can you guess something that you may have seen or have used hockey made out of carbon composites? what's that hockey sticks yeah hockey sticks hockey sticks uh, tennis rackets um, and golf golf clubs um, some of the yeah. bow and arrows um, and some of the and I will show you a little later on some of the weapons, you know, the, uh, the, the, the new weapons. The stock is heavy if you have metal or wood, but having a composite is really light. So a yeah. person can carry more ammo than actually the weapon. You don't want the weapon weight. Now you can carry more ammo uh, in a long range uh, operation. So there are, there are new, now the composite, the carbon composites are widely used on a day to day stuff as well. So, um, so let's go to the next slide. Now, <clears throat> we're gonna we're gonna take a quick look at um, how the composite, uh, and I will talk to the video in a minute. So you take the fiber, that's what you see on the very far left, and you're gonna turn that into a fabric, like what I've shown earlier. 
And then I put that into a machine, like what you see over there, and I will wrap that to a shape of an airplane. That's what you see on the third picture. And then I have to put that into a giant oven. Like your parents are cooking, baking a, uh, baking a cake, I'm baking an airplane. Because the resin, that the glue that I put on fixed. here, yes, it needs to stick and it needs to get yeah. cured. Plus, I need to make it a, a, these are called a special kind of an oven, like a pressure cooker. You know, um, it's, we call it an autoclave, but it is the same principle as, a, uh, as your home pressure cooker. Yeah. It builds pressure inside. So pressure will help to push the material against each other with a very, very high pressure and also bring the temperature up where the resin will get cured. And then after about uh, six hours or seven hours, the, the structure will be ready. And then we do a little bit of a preparation on the structure. Then we snap together like you're doing a Lego to build the airplane. So let's take a, let's watch a quick video and then yeah. we'll come to a questions. All right, let's yeah. do this. Let me know if you guys can see the video or not. Okay. Okay. One second. It should be coming up. Can you guys see my YouTube screen or not? No? Okay. Well, no. Let me, let me share in the wrong screen. Okay. Oh, man. This is taking too long. You only can see my uh, presentation slides, right? Yes. Uh, give me one second. Let me go out from there for a second. Sure, whether there's something wrong with the other Zoom or some reason it's not letting me uh, sharing it. But uh, let me let me do another click and see if I can uh, share my uh, videos here. I'm going to stop sharing for a second, and I'll be sharing in a sec. Okay. Okay. You sir. cannot see anything, right? Yeah. No, sir. Uh, still not there, Ravi. Okay, give me one second. I'm uh, to uh, have to go out of the uh, application here for a second. You know. mm -hmm.
I don't know. It's not not having a good luck here with the YouTube. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send you guys a, a list of videos along with this presentation. Um, you might be able to uh, open up individually later and uh, take a look at it. Um, let me go to to the next slide. Otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's not it's not letting me uh, download the YouTube videos and sharing it. It could be my uh, surface is not supporting. Anyway, so let me uh, let me get my some of the other things. So I so unfortunately I cannot show you the video, but uh, what I was planning to show is to show how the fiber fiber was made and how the, uh, the, the airplane is getting made uh, but I will definitely gonna send you guys the uh, uh, the, the, the video links and uh, go go and look at it and then you get me uh, uh, questions or anything but then but nevertheless after the airplane when it's being built as a big structure it's going to look like this. And this is a piece that I've cut it off from the airplane. So this could be the outside of the airplane, and this is the inside of the airplane. All airplanes have this thing called strainer. This would give the stiffness to the structure. Um, when you get to your advanced level and when you're doing your uh, applied maths and physics, you will learn uh, certain uh, subjects or certain areas called moment of inertia, the stiffness. So all of these shapes, these designs are there to get the stiffness uh, to the airplane structure. So if you look at here, it's very, very thin. Look at this, it's very thin. And it's thin here, and then it's a little thicker on the, uh, the bottom. So that means if I put a one, this would be three layers here and about a six layers over here. So if you have a metal airplane, this would be all six, six layers, the, like whatever the thickness that the airplane have, you will have it all the way across. So now you're carrying an extra weight. But having this composites material like this, now you don't have to carry the extra weight of the airplane because when uh, the, the stress guy or the, the person who's doing the calculations to understand what is the loads that the airplane go through, he can tell me, hey, I need this amount of loads here and it's going to need about a three or four plies of composites. I'm going to have this amount of loads are here, and I need to have a X amount of composites. So I can change the shape uh, and the and the layers to get whatever the structural engineer wants to, uh, and how he wants to uh, to transfer the loads when the airplane is flying. And this is a uh, another composite part made out of a carbon composite again but the how this was manufactured is different this one you will see on a videos that i'm going to send to you guys it was wrapped around a big tube this is not a airplane component this is on a uh the uh, de superbike this is the the cover for the for the engine cover now this i don't have to do that in a uh in a in a, in a in a, uh, a machine like that what I do is I take a three or four layers of the composite material and I will press that into this shape and it'll coming out of it so because this is a non-structural component this is just uh, uh, there for a uh, what do you call uh, for the for the safety of the of the engine from debris or your legs getting burned and it needs to look pretty so that's why it got this nice shape to it. So that's how we built even the spoilers, so the car bodies and et cetera, is to make like this. So it's called a compression molding method. 
So we can discuss in another day what are the different manufacturing methods that you can use to build different parts of the composite parts. But this is a, uh, what do you call a non-structural cosmetic compo composite part? Same material, but this is called a structural primary structure composite part where this would actually take airplane loads and keep the people and the airplane safe. And then um, in the future, like I mentioned, we are looking into a, uh, a material system called a nanotechnology and the nanomaterial, it's becoming more lighter. Now there are parts built using composites, uh, nanocomposites, but they are not big parts because there is no manufacturing or production system built to build mega structures like uh, airplanes or uh, shuttles. So what in the future, we will be able to uh, 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 see those uh, technologies or the materials going into the airplanes called the nanotechnology. Um, I got some material here so from Sri Lanka. What is that? GFRP. Oh yeah, there you go. That's a, that's a fiberglass. Yeah, I got it from Sri Lankan yeah. Airlines workshop actually. Yeah, so they use those to yeah. uh, uh, to do their, what do you call, most of the Sri Lankan airline airplanes like A330, A340s, yeah. they have a lot of fiberglass parts that's in there and they use yeah. those for uh, repairs. Yeah, so these are they carbon, use, yeah. the glass. Yeah, there you go, yeah. glass one, there you go, yeah. That's called, so we, if in my terms, when you show, show that again, uh, that piece of material you have in your hand, yeah. I call those a two by two twelve. So uh, when you look close, close enough, you will see the strands will go in and out, in and out, in and out every two, or two times. Yeah. So we call it a two by two twelve. Yeah. yeah. It's a, a different plot pattern, exactly. Yeah, very yeah. good. Yeah. Very good. And those are the ones we also use for uh, to build boats. Oh, okay. Boats, yeah. And boats, this is the carbon. Uh, is yeah, there you go. That's a piece of a carbon. Yes. Yeah. 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 Those oh. are so that's so that's what you have in your hand. Yeah. It's a carbon, but we call those a unidirectional tape. Now, what I showed you earlier. Yeah. It has a, the, it's, those are the fibers, what you have in your hand, the fibers only run on a one direction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is, that's what you call a tape, unidirectional tape. Mm -hmm. And this is called a multidirectional, or we call it a fabric, because it's like a fabric in your clothes. Very good. Yeah. So what's yeah. mostly used is this one or this one for airplanes? Both. Depend, Both. Depending, on the, depending on the requirements. So in my 787 airplane, on yeah. this one here that yeah. I'm showing, I have tape inside the laminate. Outside, oh, okay. I have a fabric. Because is that fabric, a part of the skin or fuselage? Or? Yes. No, this is a part of the skin. This is the skin. This oh, is okay. the skin. This is the stringer of the fuselage. Oh, okay. So this is the skin string. We call it a skin stringer structure. Skin for in the wing or the fuselage? Yeah. This, is, this goes in like that, like that, to build up the entire fuselage. Uh, now, in a, in, a, in a metal airplane, this part has to be bolted or reverted to the structure. Mm. In here, I have a one piece yeah. built in, right? So, because the fabric is tougher, I put the fabric layers outside and inside, inside this laminate, I have what you have in your hand called tape. Uh, because tape are not tougher. It needs to be protected but the yeah. tape will carry more loads. So I am protecting what's that carrying loads by the fabric set from the outside. So depending on the part, depending on the location, I do use both of those, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions, anything in the airplane world or what I do, composites, anything you can ask, floor is open. So then um, distribution of the load around the structure, how to uh, do that? So, okay. So let me... Uh, I mean, uh, in a manner, uh, as you showed us the example, uh, they are, you said that uh, um, uh, that uh, the uh, outer side, uh, he, the engineer, I mean, the aircraft manufacturer need a load for a particular amount at this amount and then 
then yeah. in other point it, he needs another amount yeah. so yeah. Uh, it's the same uh, i mean it's the same uh, yeah. flow so how to yeah. have them uh, two different yeah. rows okay yes let me show you that in a second hold on one second i'm going to use this as an example because it looks cool So this is the uh, F-18, uh, F-18 Hornet, Blue Angels Hornet, right? So now this airplane needs to go up and do turns, all kind of maneuvers, right? When you're doing a maneuver, what's going to happen to this body? Some point, certain parts getting bent more than the other areas. This wing might go up and this start getting bending more than the other side. So what we do is, when you design an airplane based upon, so this is how it works. First, we have this uh, a group goes out and talk to the airlines. They're gonna ask the airlines, hey, what kind of an airplane do you want? What do you, what kind of an airplane do you think in the 20 years that these people are going, going to use? So the the airline would say, with their numbers crunching, number crunching and talking to their smart people, uh, they say, hey, uh, I do, I want an airplane that carry 500 passengers in 15 years from now. That's my requirement. So, and I, it, they will tell you that it needs to go 0.8 Mac. It needs to go across the Atlantic, you know, from America to England, all those requirements. So when they give that requirements, then what our teams does is uh, the Boeing company or the Airbus company, they go and see what kind of a flight envelope and the airplane configuration is going to look like. So they have to come up with an engine. They have to come up with a, uh, how fast this thing going to go. So they do a calculations. They put those into a, uh, a computer models and de decide what kind of a loads this, this airplane will carry or will go through due to the turbulence, due to a uh, terrain, due to uh, temperature variations, how this airplane will bend and twist and things that will go through. And then that piece, and they will model that and they will tell the structural in the engineer, this is what the airplane is going to do. Then the structural engineer takes that information. He says, okay, if I'm going to use composite material, if I use composite material, I need to have eight plies here because that area is getting bent more than this area. And this area, I'm only going to need three plies of material because this area doesn't bend uh, as much as the root of the, uh, the, the wing uh, because that's how the computer said that it was going to bend. So he will tell me, he says, well, Ravi, I need three plies here and a five plies here and eight plies here. So this is the airplane to uh, go, you know, to, to sustain safe. Then I'll take that information. I'll go with the materials. Then I will figure it out how to put eight materials here, three materials and two materials here and build this wing. So, so it will go through the, uh, uh, the loads. So the load means when the airplane is bending, when the wing is bending, load will get transferred from the thinner area to the thicker area. So that load transfer is pre-calculated. I knew exactly that would be a three plies need to be here and an eight plies needed to be here. That's how the airplane is getting designed. And that's what we meant by the load carrying capability. And based upon that, that you can define what the number of plies or the number of different materials you want to use. Did I explain it or do, or is it, did I go too deep on you? Uh, Ravi, uh, sorry to, sorry to uh, disturb. Uh, I think there are a few people waiting to join. Uh, from your side, uh, there are a few people uh, waiting to join. From your side, can you accept them? Why? From my side? Yes, yes. I think uh, you can. Uh, you can let them in. Oh, waiting. Yeah. Waiting room. Uh, waiting room. Let me see. Where do I see the waiting rooms? From the bottom. Uh, I think you participant list above that. Yeah, I'm on the participant list. 
And I see a number of people. Let me see if I can see the way. Oh, neighbor waiting room. Uh, Should I disable the uh, waiting room or keep it enabled? And uh, how do I invite them? Is that what you're asking me to do? No, right? actually, uh, you keep it enabled and then uh, they will pop up on your screen. Uh, their names will come up. So my, mine is enabled. And how do I know that uh, they pop oh, uh, up on my screen? Yeah, uh, they will, uh, actually, they will pop up on your screen. Like on the participant list? Yes, yes. Top oh, of that. Bit, oh, let me go. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm admitting everybody now, so. It's... Yeah. All right, I think I did, all right. There you go. Right, okay, thank you. Right, thanks, sorry, okay. No I think about it, all right. So, uh, so did I answer to your question about the loads? So those loads, are they like the G-forces or the lift forces? Oh, or... yes, 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 so, sorry, my bad. Yes, <laughs> those are, those are, we, when we say loads, those are aerodynamic and mechanical loads. Aerodynamic loads are coming from the manuring and going through a different terrains. And then you have the mechanical loads coming from uh, moving the ailerons or moving the rudder and, uh, and also the G-forces as well. You're right. Yes. Sorry. My, my, my bad. Yeah. Yes. All of those being accounted. All no. of those. Mechanical loads as well as the aerodynamic loads. Yeah. Sorry to disrupt, but um, before an airplane is flown, uh, uh, do they take an airplane into a stress test, like um, to test the flexibility of the wings and the fuselage? Yeah. Yes. Okay, can you, what's the question? Uh, before an airplane is flown, so oh, yes. uh, to test the flexibility yeah. and the okay. durability of the wings. It's, more than, it's, it's more than that. So what we do is, uh, believe it or not, we're gonna build, we typically before airplanes get released to, uh, to, for production, not even to the airlines, we build airplanes and we, we assign after we uh, have so many airplanes in the manufacturing line, we'll tell the airplane number five through eight will be going to American Airlines, 10 to 12 would go to uh, uh, United uh, as well as different airlines. So before even we ever build an airplane, we build two airplanes exactly like how we're planning to build. And we call that a static airplane and a fatigue airplane. Static airplane, it goes into a rig. That means a, uh, uh, a sort of a rig that actually can bend. Basically what we do is we bend the entire airplane we have lots of strain gauges, lots of camera, high-speed cameras. Then we bend the entire airplane, the fuselage and the wings up to its maximum uh, or ultimate loading conditions and beyond until it cracks. And that's based upon that, then we'll know, okay, if you apply a static load about X amount, it can bend up to this much and this is our breaking point. That will validate our calculation. Then another airplane, we call it, we go sent through a fatigue cycle. That means once again, it's a rig. And what it does is it goes through lots of different vibrations and the movements and everything and put that through into a hundred cycles, 200 cycle, 100,000 cycles, 200,000 cycles, different amount of cycles to see how long can it sustain a long vibrations, long amount of loading conditions and will it gonna break at that point? None of those conditions, should ever break the airplane. If our calculations are right, we typically, when we do the calculation, we calculate what is the maximum strength or the breaking point of this. And then we add another 1.5 safety factor. That means a designer will design the airplane another one and a half percent more than what, what it's required or factored in. So that way, when you're doing those testing, it will ensure that it will never break. Or if it breaks, it is way beyond the limits that we ever, airplane will ever go through. Even the airplane has to go through the worst landing you can ever imagine 
that has been tested or validated through that uh, uh, the fatigue and the uh, and the static cycle. And the second special thing that we do in the composite is we cut this entire airplane into a pieces like this. What you see here is a, 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 a test article, like it's a, it's a fully built airplane and then we cut into a little pieces like this. Then what I do is I polish these edges using a sandpaper and I scan this edge. Then I can see inside using a microscope, I can see inside this uh, the structure. And then I can validate the, the design and the assumptions we made to ensure that when you are manufacturing an airplane, the airplane internal structure meets the design requirement. So there are lots of, uh, there's a lots of validations you do. Typically we, we build first three or four airplanes and we destroy all three or four airplanes just to make sure they are, uh, 100% safe or 200% safe to fly. And then only we, uh, we, we say like uh, the FAA or the CAA will give us a, a, an authority to go and build for production. Did I, did I explain it to you guys all right on that? Um, yes, yeah. thank you. Yep. Any other questions? So what are the lights uh, on the airplanes? There are uh, white lights on the uh, rudder and there are uh, green light and a red light on the side. What does that green mean? Those are, those are navigation. White lights are like typically you have the floodlights that's purely for the visual purposes. Yeah. And then you have navigation lights, green and red. So yeah. green and red is always on the, on the specific location. So if you are looking at it, you can see whether the airplane in, in the darker days, you can see the, whether the airplane is coming towards you or going away from you. Can I have another question? Yeah. Uh, why airplanes are not flying through may, over the may Pacific Ocean? No, they, oh, all right. There are, well, it's not that they cannot. There are a lot of airplanes do fly over the Pacific Ocean, um, but what you're trying to do is to so uh yeah hold on a second okay sir. so this is a 787 that has two engines this is 747 four engines right if i fail the one engine here I have three more engines to go. <clears throat> if I fail the second engine, I have three more engines to go, two more engines to go, right? <clears throat> if I fail the one engine, I have one engine to go, right? And yeah. then if I fail the next one, I don't have any engines to go. So it's not that engines ever gonna fail. Engines never fails, but there are instances it can fail. And the, and the, <laughs> so there are multiple reasons why they are flying it in a uh, reasons. One, if you take in the sh if you take the globe, if you're looking at the shortest routes, why do you want to fly the longest route? I know the pilot would like it because he'll get the flying hours, but it's going to take a long. You want to go through the to land as possible, right? So if you unflatten it, sometimes you are thinking you are you you think that you want to go this way. But actually, you have to go this way as your shortest route from the polars, right? And the second part is for the safety reasons. If, there, if you are checking your uh, route close to the land, right? Then in case if there is a medical emergency or an airplane emergency, you mm -hmm. can land, right? If you are middle of the Pacific Ocean and you are about uh, eight hours away from a, a closest land, then you, you, know, you are taking more risk. It's not that the airplanes cannot fly, airplanes can fly. Like for an example, the longest airplane that flies right now is what? 18 hours from uh, Sydney to New York, right? So that range, you can fly across the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Pacific Ocean. It just, you can do that. One is for, you want to be shortest route, the second one is the safe route. Thank you. Oh. Um, so what if there 
there are any uh, objects on the runway during takeoff like let's say if there are some stones or something would it affect the takeoff yeah. would it harm the engines okay. yeah no very 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 good question uh, like let's say some clothes or some stones or whatever <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i mean um, if you take the uh, the engine so uh, i cannot really see it there are some precautions were done here but now if there is a, some object in there if it gets sucked into the engine yeah yeah i mean you are in a bad spot but there's also the rocks there could be some metal pieces can also hit the airplane the structure and can damage the structure and when you go up on the air and blow up right because the airplane is getting pressurized and if there is a hole now you can damage the the, the or the blow up the airplane right yeah to avoid that what we designing we reinforce the bottom part of the airplane uh, especially on the tail side because when you are when your tires we, that's another reason why you have the engine far, far away as much as so if there is a debris on the ground right let's say if the airplane is now about to take off right the debris is somewhere here it's not in line with the uh, the engine right the only way the engine or the probability of getting an object into the engine is from the wheels spinning it off like when you are skidding the wheels you know it can it can shoot some objects into it but the probability is hitting from that is lower here but we have reinforced the the engine the sides of the engine the bottom of the airplane and especially the back side of the airplane when you actually rotating to uh, take off to when it you might hit a lot of debris here and also you might hit the tail on the runway too so we have a thing called a tail skid or reinforcement here just in case if you hit it if you if you hit anything then uh, it'll it would not damage it so just but, like the concord crash yeah i mean yeah yeah this like the concord but yeah and but if there is a uh, like that's why like if you have a, a what do you call the the birds are flying and one of the birds yeah. goes right into the engine yeah then you there is no way you can mm -hmm. i mean yeah there's a chance now you can fail the engine that's why it's very important not to have any uh, pod we call it foreign object debris on so the runway do, so the airports do regular inspections of the runway oh, yeah yeah there is actually a good youtube video about uh, uh the heathrow airport the airports like uh, what we have in katunayaka you have a, a plenty of time in between the airplanes to go and clean it up but a places like heathrow you only have a two minutes between the airplanes uh one one the when the one airplane lands and the next airplane will land in a two minutes from now right so they have to plan at what point one of those uh, cleaning trucks going to go and uh, clean up each runway so what they do is they space out the airplane instead of uh, they they already plan this they will say the 50th airplane and up to 50 number one airplane number two airplane number three airplane number four airplane they all land every two minute interval but they will say the 50th airplane to the 51 airplane there will be a seven minute interval or they will say the 50 50th 51st 51st airplane to say like slow down or go a higher altitude and you are going to be seven minutes uh, uh, lag be between the the fiftieth guy, so that gap is is designed for one of those cleaning trucks to go and pick up any and check and pick up any uh, debris from the runway. Go and so, Google search. Go and Google um, search. Excuse me. Yeah. Sir. Yeah. Go, yeah. Go for it. Sir, so, so what are the materials being used in making a bulletproof body? I mean, a bulletproof aircraft. Are composite materials being used? Absolutely, absolutely. The uh, so there are there are uh, there is a specific material called Kevlar. It's a uh, it's a new it's a, a different type of a fiber. It's the most tough. Those are the ones what the police or the uh, armored body armors and etc. But the problem with the Kevlar is they are very very uh, heavy. So. The, the airplanes on a certain areas you have a um, let me put it this way the, uh, the new airplanes the, uh, the the fighters for an example f 8 is there are certain areas you have a Kevlar mixed and a Kevlar for not necessarily for the bulletproof purposes there are 
I mean, uh, we are not in the age where you are fighting on a dog fight, right? Going after each other and shooting each other with the bullets. They are also like a, a missiles or a rocket or a cannons, right? The only reason that you're going to get into a, a bullet fight is when you come down onto a, uh, a ground attack or something like that, right? But those are getting a little uh, away from that. You can target from hundreds of, I mean, hundreds of uh, feet away, or uh, thousands of feet away, uh, or a bullet cannot reach. But the areas where you do have an you know, old aircraft, they use Kevlar material and they use composites. At some instance, they also use metal. And sir, uh, are, are commercial aircrafts are bulletproof? Are designed to be bulletproof? Like, no. uh, are they resistant to bullets? No. Yeah, no, no, their commercial airplanes are, I mean, there are, um, there are certain impact can be taken, but not, not all the, no, no. If you, if you shoot it, you will, you will make a hole, a hole in it. Don't do okay, it. Thank you, sir. Why are you planning to uh, shoot a plane? No, sir. No, sir. No. <laughs> um, so I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I heard that uh, uh, usually what we what science says is that uh, the air density at sea level is higher than the air density over uh, or up in the sky. So yeah. I heard density. that uh, when a when a plane uh, flies up and uh, goes higher, the that the fuselage expands a bit because of the yeah, difference yeah. in air pressure yeah, yeah, yeah. in the it's cabin pressure and the. Yeah, it's not, uh, well, yeah, it's not necessarily sometimes with the uh, air, uh, the, the density itself, but it's also with the aerodynamics as well. So uh, I was fortunate to, uh, to do a study um, when the, soon after the, uh, the Concorde crash, the first Concorde crash, uh, I was working in a laboratory uh, in, uh, in England. Uh, they did a lot of material work and they were looking for, uh, for the new materials to reinforce the uh, the Concorde for, for those kind of things. So the Concorde airplane, when you're flying in the certain speeds and when you're making a maneuver, when you're making a change or when you're actually turning, you actually, I can see there's the actual fuselage bend six inches like this. So if I'm sitting at the very back of the airplane, if I'm looking at the very front of the airplane, I can see it's bending it. That's why on the Concorde, every six seats, I think, or eight seats, there is a, call a sort of a, a, a screen so that people don't get uh, uh, afraid of the bending. And even on normal airplanes, if you look at outside, the wings are not straight, the wings are not always stiff like that. It goes up and down, it bends. And also in the metal airplanes, because of the th coefficient of thermal expansion, Along with the aerodynamics, the, the airplane can str uh, stretch as well as it can contract as well. So in a metal airplanes, when you're making a panels, like a, to build a fuselage, you leave a gap. So the gap will allow it to expand and contract because if I have a no gap, when the one portion, one metal to another metal, when it's time to expand, it'll get, uh, it'll act, start creating a stress rise. So we leave a gap. Uh, it's not a gap means uh, that you can see through gap. It's a, it's a planned gap with a, we call it a strap on. So it will allow the airplane to expand or the contract. Yes, you're right. So there is a, uh, it's not a, just a density. It's a lot of, lot of factors can uh, expand or contract or bend the airplane. Oh, can I ask another question? Sir? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, Basically, I heard that uh, there is this zone in the atmosphere where planes can't fly higher than that zone. It's a zone near space, but yeah. uh, if if a plane does fly higher than that dead zone, that uh, dead zone you call it, I guess, uh, yeah. that people and everyone will die and uh, there would be a severe mid-flight crash because of the difference in pressure and the entry to space. Well, it's not just the pressure, right? You don't have oxygen. Your, your air density goes down and your percentage of the oxygen is going down and then you cannot combust. Your plane doesn't have power. Yes. So that's, right? So that's why. And then, uh, then this plane crashes, yeah. And then after a certain point, 
then your, you don't have your airplane inside the pressure is greater than the outside the pressure, right? So it will blow up. Sir? So what will be a message uh, to the people who wishes to be pilot? I mean, for the future pilots, what will be a message? Uh, first of all, I want to ask a question. Are you, are you planning to become a pilot? Yes, sir. I have a dream. Why Why you want to be a pilot? Uh, of course, I, li I like flying. I love flying. You like flying or you like the lifestyle? Which one do you like most? The boat, sir. Okay. If you are, if you like for flying, go for it. If you like for the uh, lifestyle, don't go for it because that's that's a false statement. The lifestyle that you are seeing is in Sri Lanka or a few other places. <clears throat> it's just a, a fake one. It's not real. If you love flying, you can do the same way that I do. You can uh, you can be an engineer and you can fly whenever you want, right? But if you're flying to for the glamour, don't do it. And uh, because it's not worth it. Uh, the second part is, and my, and I'm saying it because my best friend, my the best friend, uh, he's my groom, uh, best man in the wedding. We were from the day one. He's a pilot in Sri Lankan Airlines, Paul Shitawanagu. Um, and, uh, it's not that he's a bad pilot or he's not having a good life or anything like that. Don't fly for the glamour. Fly for love for the machine. Um, the second part is, the part that most of the people thinks is the if you are want to be a pilot, be the most humble person you can be. Most of the time, the pilots think they fly high, but they don't. They just they 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 just sit in there, and there's about hundreds of people, thousands of people ensuring that he's flying up there safely. So you have to be the most respectful person to the one who's actually clearing the runway. Because if he doesn't do that job, your job is on the jeopardy. Your life is on the jeopardy. So be a humble person if you ever become a pilot. Second, and the third, final one is just don't be a, just a pilot. It, it's not, I would say, follow up with a, an engineering or a bachelor's degree at minimum. Have a qualification other than a pilot license. Pilot license is good to a certain extent. And after that, you do need to have a degree um, to excel. But, it, but in Sri Lankan airlines and the airlines like in Asia, it, it doesn't matter. Um, but you know, if, you, if you're looking for a, um, you know, like other, other countries, the pilots are pretty much same as an engineer. He's well-rounded about the airplane as an engineer. And as a good engineer, is also a good pilot and also a good pilot is an engineer. So be humble. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, sir, I'm asking you what are the basic elements using in the stealth fly? Like F-22 Raptor? What is these basic elements? Uh, what do you mean by yeah. that? Uh, how do they stay undirected to the radar? So uh, there are so I I, I don't know in details uh, because uh, I haven't worked on um, F22 or F35, but I have some knowledge about certain um, airplanes how to make it stealth, and I cannot share that. Uh, but it is a combination of a material coating. So it is a uh, there are special met material coatings that you put on the structure and also there are a, a, a sort of shapes that we create on the structure when the radar signal comes in either it will absorb the signal or it will scramble the signal or it will deflect the signal and uh, and to and also to minimize the heat dissipation that's coming from the engines so there is a lot of technology developed around the exhaust of the engine to cool down the, the air that comes out from the engine. So you don't create a heat signature. But fundamentally, you create a, you have a very proprietary, very secret coatings that you put on where it can absorb the radar signals. And there will be an, a certain angles that you create on the surface of the, uh, the airplane where the radar would not go back. It will deflect somewhere else. And, uh, and or 
there will be a, uh, a scrambler. There will be a technology in the cockpit where it can scramble the other radar signal that's coming through. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, my other question is, uh, sir, how the, I mean, is there any specific uh, researchers to use artificial intelligence to, uh, the, to fly the aircraft without a pilot in Boeing yeah, uh, Airbus? Yeah. Yes, yes, no, no, Airbus, come on. Who talks about Airbus? The best airplanes are made in Boeing. We don't talk about <laughs> Airbus. <laughs> so, yeah, so unmanned airplanes are fairly, it's not a new thing. It's, it's been there even way before I was there. Um, but we, we take, uh, for an example, we have a, uh, uh, the perfect wingman. If you Google perfect wingman, wingman, you will see a, the newest Boeing unmanned fighter jet that is actually introducing to the, to the market. It will be in the future. Most of the fighter jets, currently you have a pilot on it, will be, uh, will, will eliminate, we are planning to eliminate that pilot in the future. Because the pilot means I have to put a safety factors in there. I have the pilot carry a weight, but if I don't have a pilot and the, and the safety features that goes to for the pilot, then I can put more bullets or rockets in, right? So the unmanned uh, the airplanes are there. And uh, we also have F-16 airplanes. Uh, some of the F-16 airplanes, when you get old, uh, with a, where we have a pilot, we use a, uh, we use, a, I would not say just a artificial intelligence. They are more like a very smart intelligence uh, uh, softwares. Uh, to train pilots, uh, to train uh, the other F-16s, so like a bogies, you know, it's a bogies, right? So you have yeah, a, yeah. So I use the fake, or not fake, the real F-16s, but doesn't have a pilot to to act as a bogey. So if I'm on the other F-16, so I can actually shoot down an actual plane and do some dog fighting and to learn the maneuvers. Uh, so yeah, but you cannot do that on a commercial airlines. Uh, imagine you got onto an airplane and you realize there is no pilot in the front. How do you feel? It doesn't matter how safe you are, uh, people get freaked out. So, uh, so, so you need to have a, uh, somebody in, the, uh, in, a, in a commercial airplane. But on a uh, military airplane, so yeah, that would, in the future, you, would not, you don't need a, a, a fighter pilot. You will have a, a, a unmanned airplanes or somebody actually manned uh flying okay. from a distance like a remote in a remote location so, so, would, it, so would it be sixth generation or seventh generation when when will it be started so um, it's it's already there it's it's not that uh, you're probably not seeing it but it's already there okay thank you sir so I'm why sorry, do you I do have a question uh, who has the question sorry I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, this. Yeah, that's fine. What's the question? So you are a Sri Lankan, right? Of course. Yeah, <laughs> where, where, what do you study? What did you focus the subjects? Uh, oh, what so did I, you did, focus uh, I did uh, mathematics for a maths, uh, applied maths, pure maths, physics, and chemistry for my A-levels. Yeah. Uh, and I did aerospace engineering afterwards, yeah. So uh, may after your A-levels, what did you do? Uh, I went to, uh, Aeros I went to uh, AAC and uh, followed the Kingston uh, de degree program. And um, I did aerodynamics, uh, space technology, manufacturing technology, uh, Advanced mathematics, calculus. Um, I mean, I cannot remember. Material science. So, which year did you graduate? Uh, 1990, I, 1999. I graduated in 1999. I entered in 1996. So you all were the first to go to Kingston, yeah? From the so yeah. first. Yes. <laughs> so, is it a three year degree, right? Three year degree program? The aerospace uh, no, degree? It is a three-year program plus a one-year yeah. we call it sandwich program uh, internship. Or I did I did a one-year internship and I did a, a extra year for my MH and I did my masters afterwards. Yeah. 
So did you go to Cranfield after that or? Imperial. Imperial. Okay. So then how did you come up to Boeing uh, from Kingston oh, after really graduating? Good. Boeing is a long story. So I started, uh, I started at Imperial. After that, I went and worked for a, a laboratory called Applied Capacits. Uh, sorry, a National Physical Laboratory in Teddington, uh, suburb of England. I did a lot of research on composite materials, not necessarily for aerospace, but more on the testing side of the material, the mechanical testing, the strength of the material. And from there. Uh, I had a six years that I actually did various things in the aerospace industry. I, so here's the thing. I mean, this is a risk, risk that I took, but not necessarily you should be taking it. I did my piloting that six years. I went to learn how to fly an airplane. I did my master's on that six years. And I did, but I did work part-time as well. Um, I worked, I, I became a, uh, a, a, senior manager at the uh, the mcdonald's restaurants as well <laughs> working at that while i was doing my master's program as a senior manager for a store and uh, that's a good experience and uh, and at the same time so remember when you become an engineer when you're becoming an engineer like myself who likes to do research and who wants also to be an engineer at the same time you need to have a hands-on skill what that means is you need to know how to build things right so if you take a four-year course and if you do your things, becoming, in my opinion, I, I felt like I was very constrained in front of a computer. I did not know how to build things. So I went and worked as a mechanic um, on a small shop for two, three years to learn how to build things, to run a machine, what is the machine languages, how to do PC programming, like what is a technician. So when I, when I, after that, I worked uh, as a contractor for the A350 plus. And then uh, I did a little bit of more work with uh, EGAT, another aerospace company in Europe. And from there, I came to Texas because I got married. My wife, she's, she's from Candy, but she's living in Texas. And then uh, from there, I went and worked in another company that do various different composite structures for aerospace industry called Applied Composites Engineering. And from there, I got headhunted to do a, uh, uh, a project called uh, ARX-70 helicopter, making or using composites material. It's an Army reconnaissance helicopter. I was the project engineer for that. When I was doing that, and uh, I got invited to work for Boeing company. So how long you be, you been in Boeing? This is going to be my 14th year. Uh, that's in Seattle, is it? Uh, no, across the entire United States. Seattle, I permanently moved to Seattle last February. Uh, uh, but, oh, yeah. So if you are a Sri Lankan national only, it's, it's kind of hard to work in the U.S. in the aerospace industry, is it? Uh, I'm not a... I'm, well, I'm not a Sri Lankan citizen. I am a... I'm a, yeah. I'm a yeah, so that's why... Yes, you're right. So they don't offer sponsorship, like work permits and stuff. Yeah, no, yeah. Because because I I came through once I I all I mean I came through the British part of it and also the uh, uh, the marriage side of it um, and my qualification. Yeah, oh, okay. uh, they, they had a specific need and uh, but they did not need it to sponsor me. But yes, yeah. you're right. Because in yeah, in my case. Uh, yeah, I'm just a Sri Lankan citizen, so I finished my aerospace degree in Kingston. Yeah. Did some internship in Sri Lankan Airlines, and now I want to move to the US or Canada. So I'm kind of lost on. Go, um, go to Canada. Go to Canada. Okay. Yeah. yeah, go to Canada and get to most of my. I have a lot of colleagues, Sri Lankan, some of our Sri Lankan colleagues from, uh, from other countries. They moved to Canada, and there is yeah. a big body presence in Canada. Yeah, you, you should go and do your master's or your PhD in Canada. And then as soon as you do your master's or PhD, they give you an opportunity to work in Canada. Oh, okay. System, and then you get your work permit there. And then yeah. when you become a citizen of uh, Canada, then you can work in the United States. Oh, okay. So the easiest option would be to come on the PR option for Canada. Right. Yeah. To, to, uh, to come to, if you, if you don't have, I mean, one of the ways to come to United to get a, a aerospace job in the United States is coming to Canada. 
Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Even Canada has a good aerospace industry. It's not just. But it's smaller than the US, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. we are the big manufacturer. Yeah. yeah. But remember, the things will be changed in the next few years. Yeah. Oh. Very well what you do, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you come through the, through the green card lottery, that's another option as well. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. But we, we they, they canceled all the immigration stuff, Mr. Trump. Oh, because of the COVID, is it? No, no, no. Even um, he, he was very, he put on hold on all immigration stuff right now. Right. Yeah. Any more questions, gentlemen? Uh, yes, sir. I'll give you um, another five to ten minutes. After that, I have to hit the bed. <laughs> all right. So, sir, what do you think is the most uh, hardest field of aeronautical engineering, right? Like there are airframe engineers, stress engineers, and various types of aeronautical engineers. What do you think is the hardest? Um, I don't think anything is hard. I don't think anything is easy either. It's, it's, like I said, it's, uh, when, you, when you come over to this side of the world, your mentality will change. When you're in Sri Lanka, when you're a pilot in Sri Lanka, imagine how many people will, how many pilots in Sri Lanka will look down upon you because you are an aircraft engineer. You are the second person, right? They think they're the first person. But it's not like that uh, outside that four walls. It's because of the, the way we culture there. But in here, everybody's equal. Like in my team, I have a stress engineer, I have a design engineer, I have a manufacturing engineer. I have a composites engineer. I have an industrial engineer. I have an operations engineer. All of those people have to equally perform an equally hard job. It's in the life. It's, it's part of the life. It's making this thing. It's not a one person's job. A one person's responsibility. It's a responsibility of a group of people's minds. So don't think one is easier than the other one. The only difference is there are some people how they digesting the information and they uh, can come up with the solutions are different. Like for an example, most of the people who like numbers would go for to become a stress engineer. He or she will not be much successful with their hands. They are good with their numbers on the head. But that doesn't make them more important because I'm not good on numbers. I am good with hands. If I don't speak his language or her language, her language is only or her his language is only limiting to the piece of paper, numbers. If my hands cannot read her numbers, then I don't know what to do. So both has to come together. So you have to understand you have to find out what is your skill is, what's your personalities. Are you are a person that likes to use hands and visualize things and put stuff together. Or you are a person who can visualize things and run numbers and do number crunching is your best part. Or are you are a person who likes to be around a machine and packing this machine and designing a machine and putting a machine apart. Who are you? And uh, some people are, can done all of those aspects, but some people are good off on certain things. So you have to find out what is your inner strength. Thank you, sir. Um, can you do a similar uh, Zoom meeting sort of a thing uh, when you go back to your office back in Boeing where we can see things? No. What you do? no. <laughs> I, uh, I, can, I can tell you what I do and I can show you what I have in my home office. No, that is a... Uh, first, we are not... Boeing does not support Zoom. Second, yeah. uh, 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 because, because of the security reasons, we, we do not share our workspace. I do not share my work email to yeah. very limited people, or, and um, and we don't even uh, discuss what we talk do. So these days you work from home, anyway, is it? Yeah, yeah. This is this. Uh, what you see is my uh, here. Let me show you. This is my desk. This is yes. my home office. My bookcase, and uh, and I'm also learning. I am not an electrical guy, so <laughs> I'm not much into the electronics. So, uh, but now. Today, I'm actually making a, it's a, this is an Arduino circuit uh, or a processor. I'm trying to uh, build a, a, a moisture controller, uh, a drip irrigation system, automated drip irrigation system, where 
I can read the moisture. I don't have to go and water the plants. So, uh, so it'll, it'll read if there is a rain. It'll read when it's a nighttime. It'll read the moisture of the uh, of the soil, and it'll then trigger a, a water line to go and uh, dissipate water. So, so yeah. So never stop learning. Always learn. Uh, Ravi, um, sorry, are we, are we missing any uh, important slides? So, uh, anything, imp uh, any important slides from your, your side? No, no. I was actually, that was on the very end of the slides and okay. I have videos that I want to share, but I will send you the links, share with the, the rest sure, of the crowd. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. I'll give you guys five more minutes and then uh, I have to hit the bed. What's the time for you, Ram? It's, uh... Quarter past eleven. Right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, what else you guys want to see? Uh, here, I hear. Here is a. If you if you do invent certain things, um, let me show you something. These are my invention awards. So uh, basically, U.S. patents. And uh, they're up there. And. and uh, there's some more here. These are all the US patents or the awards for inventing things or building things. And uh, yeah, this is my, this is my, this is where I spend most of my time. Yeah. And uh, Ravi, do you have any, sorry, uh, Ravi, do you have any patents? I heard the other day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I have uh, 30 patents, patents. Actually, here are the, uh, some of the plaques that I received. Okay. All right. Yeah. So that belongs to you, right? Not the company or anyone. Well, yeah. It belongs to me, but if I, anything that I think, anything I disclose now, it's also Boeing, it belongs to the Boeing company because right. I work. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I also here is my bookshelf. So I also read completely different things. Can you guys even see this this book? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> And uh, and I read about the Buddhism, and uh, yeah, I read uh, different things. So everything you can learn something. So I never stop learning. Yeah. Where in Sri Lanka are you from? Uh, so I grew up in Colombo, but uh, I call my home is uh, my mother is from Rattapura, and uh, my dad is from Padavata. So uh, ah, okay. I spend most of my time either in uh, Padavata or Rattapura during holidays. But yeah. I grew up in Montevideo. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anything else, gentlemen? One last time. So, what can you say about the work and life balance in the US? How is the life over there? Uh sucks. I uh... <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, uh, life is. Uh, if you ask me. Um, um, the definition of the life uh, is a very very serious question, but yes. if you ask me, uh, am I driving a nice vehicle? Yes, absolutely. Am I? Do I have a nice house? Absolutely. Do I have a beautiful kid? Absolutely. Uh, do I have any financial issues? No, I'm I'm fairly compensated, and uh, and the Boeing company treats me really. You work really really. I mean, you work sometimes 10, 15 hours a day to, uh, to, to have all of that, right? Uh, for me, life is beyond that. For me, it's a life, right? I miss Sri Lanka. I, trust me, if I can trade places with you guys, I know Sri Lanka is the, is the worst country uh, as you might think because you are staying there, nothing is happening. Government is always messed up, but I tell you what, it's 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 still Sri Lanka. It's a unique place. You cannot find that kind of a place anywhere in the world. Only country that has a, a president competing on elections again and again. That beautiful. That's how beautiful it is. So I miss Sri Lanka so much, and uh, I my dream is someday to come to Sri Lanka and 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 learn about Buddhism. I want to learn deep into the Buddhism and. Uh, be a good person. And, uh, and so how old are you right now? Me. I'm only 25 years old. <laughs> well, I've just passed 40. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
I'm getting old. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, how often do you come to Sri Lanka? Uh, I was there last year, last August. Oh, okay. And uh, I could not come to the AAC last time. I was there a year before where I visited the uh, AAC. Uh, yeah. And uh, I was planning to come this year, but it's not going to happen. But definitely I'll be there next year. Yeah. Okay. Remember, the life is beyond the materialistic things. Read. Read and understand who you are what you really really want in your life everything else will one second the switch will go off it could be your eight years old or it could be your 50 years old or you could be 90 years old should you go off right at that time nothing matters only what matters is what you read what you have read what you have accomplished internally mindfulness there are some time Spare some time to reflect yourself and look around and to be a good person. That'll be more, that'll bring more peace to your life and more satisfaction than anything that I have achieved. Any, any more questions guys? Yeah. I know, I know this is, that's too deep for you guys. And you, you gonna think that I'm, yes, you'll, you'll realize that. From the Buddhism perspective. Yes. Or even yeah. any other religion perspective, yeah. right? Yeah. How, how do you inform us if there's any, any more upcoming Zoom meetings or whatever? Uh, that's all belongs to Mr. Uh, Sharon. Uh, he's, the, uh, he's the organizer. Definitely, I'll keep posting. Don't worry. I'll keep posting. Uh -huh. All right. Give me a feedback. Did you guys have a good time? Enjoyed? Learned? Yeah. 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 All right. Very much. What did you learn? What is the? What Purpose. is the? Yeah. Did, so now, like you guys know what it is, right? Yeah. All right. Good. All right. Sharon, anything else, man? Um. Uh, all good. So, uh, if there's a uh, another session, I'll, I'll keep you posting, guys. Uh, watch updates. Three years per son, is it? Uh, What's it? Actually, that's the that's the uh, Zoom account we are using. Okay. You are AAC now, is it? Yes, yes. Ah, oh, I see. Okay. So, okay. Uh, by, the way, by the way, this is good. I I heard that there are people from Candius also. Uh, yes, we got some Canadians. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Very good. Yeah. yeah. And some people. Call, yeah, some people call me to get into the uh, actually uh, conference because they couldn't. Uh, so uh, finally, I think uh, they're also here, right? All are here. So it's good. We got about 20 uh, participants. Right now we have 15. But some it's the first time you did it. So uh, yeah, thanks for your time, Ravi. I know you were, you were busy uh, and you are a busy person. And uh, thanks for giving your time. So uh, no problem. Yeah, so it, it will be really helpful for our guys, you know, our, our, our uh, school uh, kids. So uh, let's plan another day. I think they are looking forward to it. So uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, maybe on the next time, let's we can talk about uh, how to make things, you know, how to make the composite material into the parts. Yeah. You know, what technologies out there and stuff like that. And uh, yeah. Okay. Um, any any questions? Final questions, guys, before we wrap up the session. Right. Okay. Okay, Ravi. Then uh, thanks yeah. for your time. Yeah. Listen, wherever you guys go in the future, whether it's a, whatever the country, remember we are first Sri Lankans, right? Yeah. All right. Good. <laughs> we get proud. Right. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank you, Ravi. Good night. Thanks for. Good thanks night, for sir. Time. Yeah. Thank you, sir. God. Thank you, sir. God bless. God bless. Thanks. Thank you.